Hey everyone, in today's video we're joined by none other than older INFP A Insights D. D is known for her thought-provoking insights and introspection into the soul and heart of the INFP personality type. And in today's video we had an amazing discussion on everything from the INFP childhood to the development of the INFP to answer some questions about where the INFP's core values come from and how D came to develop different traits throughout her life. Watch to learn more about what is possible as an INFP and how you can mature into a positive and actualized example of the INFP personality type. When did you realize that you were an INFP? I realized I was an INFP when I took the MBTI test, actually probably uh, maybe about five or six years ago. Uh, um, so that's when I knew, yeah, it fits. I, I feel better. Okay. And do you think that your life would have been better if you realized that you were an INFP at an earlier time in life? Yes, I know it would. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, when I was really young, my grandparents had a farm. And I would go to, and I lived in the town, and very strict environment and structured. When I would go to my farm with my grandparents, my grandparents let me do whatever I wanted to do. They're very loving. They're very kind. I think they were a lot of feelers. Um, and so I grew up, halfway grew up with feelers. And if I had been able to be that way every day and when I was back home in school and with my family, I know I would be um, a lot more of who I was meant to be and not have to stuff it down and pretend. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So when do you feel you started to really discover what your core values in life were? Um, well, that I knew what my core values were. I've always had strong core values, even though I did test as INTP, which wasn't very strong. I um, I was strong-minded. Um, uh, my mother told me stories of when I was like one year old. Um, and, and I was always very independent, always very strong-minded. I don't know of myself as never being that way. Mm. Um, it just was my parents wanted to take that part out of me and behave like everybody else. Right. Yeah, I often see that uh, we today tend to say, you know, a good child is an obedient child, when right. in reality, a lot of the time we know that the children that are the most wild and the most strong in their cells and what they want are usually the most likely to uh, be successful later in life. So it's funny how we got that so backwards. Exactly. Yes. My father used to say children are to be seen and not heard. Yeah, but uh, we want to cultivate our own identities and find out who we are and what we want. And we want to go and fight for what we want, too. So Right. Mm. Exactly. What would you say that uh, your INFP childhood was like? And uh, how do you feel that you manifested INFP qualities when you were younger? Um. When I was younger, um, even as a toddler, um, I had a lot of empathy. Uh, number one, I like to be in nature. I love to be outside. And I was um, in a position where I could be outside. Um, my parents wanted <laughs> all of us to be outside. Um, I empathized with everything. I, I didn't want to kill a fly. Like I was one of these that if there was a fly in the house, I would go catch it and throw it outside. Um People who got bullied in school, I would take up for them. I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't ad address the bully. I would empathize with the uh, and nurture the person who was bullied. Um, I love the underdog. Um, that's just um, like in in recess when we played sports. I would be the captain because I was good in sports. I would always pick the person first who got picked last, mm -hmm. so that they would be picked first once. Right. Those types of things. I can't remember not ever not having these values and lifestyle. No. So where do you think, uh, if you reflected on that, where do you feel that desire to be a healer or a supporter of other people, especially the underdog, where do you think that comes from? Um, that's a good question. 
I don't know where that comes from. Um, I don't know. I th I would think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. This is INFP thing. I think it has to do it with me, particularly it has to do with my intuition. Um, I'm very strong. I'm an extremely strong intuitive. I'm like 80% in, in, on the intuition part. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I just knew or felt it's I go by what just feels right. Um, and I don't ever remember not having that. I remember when I got to be an adult, I had to stuff that down when I got started working and having my own family. Um, you can't go by that. Um, uh, so a lot has to do with, I think, intuition, it, it, how developed that is. And, and children and animals have very strong developed intuition. Um, society will take it out of you when you start having to deal with the uh, rules and regulations of it. Do you feel like uh, it was more a desire to help other people and uh, empathize with others? Or do you feel like it was more a desire to rebel against, uh, you know, society and the people in charge and, you know, the people in school that were the top dogs, I guess? Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting you say that. Um, I think uh, both depending on the the life stage. Um, mm -hmm. When I was real little, it, it came from a genuine place of empathy. Um, the older I got um, and the more resistance I got um, to me uh, from the, um, you know, from teachers, from the authority figures, teachers, preachers, parents, whoever. Uh, and the older I got, um, particularly around puberty and teenage years on, then I got rebellious. Yes, I was very rebellious as a teenager. Mm. Yes. And when do you think your creativity started coming out more? Um, the creativity part um, came out. I started writing poetry when I was like second or third grade. Um, started reading what I call the adult books in the library at second grade. So I was a reader. And um, so my creativity really started coming out at, in poetry and writing and specifically poetry and um, turned out to be dark poetry, but a lot about death. <laughs> I saved all my poems. If I could find them, I'm going to publish them on my channel, but it's a whole lot about death and dying. And I'm thinking, where does this come from? But now I understand where it comes from because back then I was more turbulent type. And um, so uh, I went into the rabbit hole a whole lot. <laughs> Yeah, because you didn't experience death uh, when you were younger uh, from anyone uh, in your family or near. Um, not not when I was um, a child, not when I was, say, from the time I was born that I can remember. And I can remember events from maybe like two years old up until maybe 12. Um, I started changing at 12. Hmm. And what would you say, like, your teenage years were like? <laughs> well, I was a product of the 60s. <laughs> if anybody knows what's going on in the 1960s. So um, my teenage years was um, I just um, I opted out. That's what I called it, opted out. I stopped studying. I was a good student, but nothing I ever did was good enough. You know, it's, um, I didn't feel that confident with myself because uh, I was told, is not good enough. You're not good enough. Um, so I stopped studying. I stopped reading. Um, started hanging around the wrong kind of crowds, um, not the studious kind of people. Not, I deliberately picked friends that my parents hated, um, deliberately dated people that my parents hated. <laughs> um, but we got along. You know, I felt like uh, we got along better. But, uh, you know, listening to rock music, heavy metal, well, heavy metal, I don't think was in, but uh, the heavy kind of rock and that type of thing. Um, I turned into a total hippie in college. Um, I was against the government because it was the Vietnam War. I did all that kind of stuff. You know, so. Yeah. I also had a hippie face when I was in my teenage years, so <laughs> yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. 
I went all in, had hair until uh, my shoulders and uh, was uh, uh, constantly doing protests and civil yeah. disobedience and <laughs> anti-war things. So, yeah. Right. Um, I'd say, uh, um, what uh, drove you towards uh, eventually becoming a mental health professional and eventually getting more academic and studying more again? After um, that? It um, it came out to be, um, I think I started actually studying um, as a being rebellious, as being told I'm not going, you know, like my high school counselor told me not to go to college because my tests, I don't test well. Um, you know, INFPs are not going to test well. We're daydreamers, so we can't circle A, B, C, D on tests. And she told me I'd never make it in college, um, that type of thing. Yeah, so I, I was determined that, to beat them, and um, I did well. And I got to grad school. Um, I decided for mental health, I didn't, I really wasn't trying to get into mental health. I, stu I su um, studied social work, which is, and I love policy and the social work aspect of that's a holistic view of the, the environment and the person and everything. I started out um, in domestic violence prevention, actually. Mm -hmm. And I had done volunteer work in the courts uh, for domestic violence. But then my first job was in a hospital and you just kind of evolved. Um, and then I, I enjoyed in mental health. I enjoyed mostly working with children and working with the parents of children Um most of them had ADHD and were young little children. And um, because I wanted them to, I always wanted kids to have a better life than I had as far as emotionally goes and let them know that they are okay. And I specifically wanted those with, uh, that were oppositional or had ADHD or had problems like that and couldn't get along in school, couldn't get along at home and let them know it's okay, and we'll work with you, and you're not a bad kid, you know. Um, try to fix what, um, I don't want people to go through what I went through. Yeah. So that's how I got into that, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you were told that you were not going to make it. Um, right. uh, that sounds like a very, like, extroverted thinking kind of judgment of, you know, no, right. uh, sh a direct challenge, in a sense, to you, right. in a sense. So, <laughs> and you took that, and you kind of went, uh, I, I'm, no, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to push through it. Right. It must have taken a lot of resilience, right? Right, right, right. And that's something I think um, that we have, you know, as INFPs, I think INFPs all do. Um, is that because we are told that uh, directly or indirectly, almost everywhere we go, and we if we're not told it, um, we feel like we're told it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's like I'll show you. I, I can just relay one story is that when I was 12 years old and um, my mother, and I made good grades. I mean, I'm smart. We're, we're, I and a piece are intelligent. And um, I had on my report card, I had all A's and one B. And I thought my mother would be proud of it. And so I um, showed it to her and she said, uh, yeah, she wasn't impressed. And I said, well, next time I'm going to make straight A's. And she looked at me and she said, you're too stupid hmm. to make straight A's. And that's when I was 12. And it took till I was in my 40s when I was in grad school and I got my grades and I made straight A's and I just looked at the grades and I thought I did it. You know, mm -hmm. that that memory came back to me that, you mm -hmm. know, um, I did it. I'm not that I'm not stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe when you were challenged when you were younger, you didn't really have the tools or the strength at the time to really resist it. But as you got older, that's something that grew in you. Right. Yes. Yes. Where do you feel like you got your confidence from? Um, or when? I think uh, just survival and confidence. Um, I th actually think a lot of my confidence came from my dad, who was very strict at in some ways. And I, he was, I think, an INTP. 
and he was a scientist and he was a stereotypical like INTP. And um, he would um, he would always kind of be nice to me. But at the same time, I remember the one thing he told me, and it sticks to this day when I was really little and some boys were bullying me outside and I came in to get him to go fight them. <laughs> <laughs> for him, you know, and I was crying. I'm a little girl. And I'm daddy's girl. And I said, they're, they're bullying me, they're whatever. And he said, you get back out there. He said, don't ever start a fight, but don't ever back down from one either. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> but I got back out there. And um, over the years, I've always remembered that. And over the years, whenever something or somebody's striking me down I said don't start the fight but don't back down that's a principle that's a very cool principle Eva I can see how that gives you a lot of strength in those situations right have you gotten any other principles like that over time um no um that's basically uh that's that's the one I remember um, that's the one I, I remember the most. Um, and when, if ever, did you start <laughs> getting better at managing habit building and routines? Um, I started managing routines. Um, well, I had to have a routine when I was growing up because um, I had very strict parents. But on my own to have routines, um, huh. well, in the social work field, time management is the number one problem <laughs> that we all have. So we have to learn time management. Um, but um, I'm still not good at it. Routines, um, I don't like them. And when I was working, um, I would actually have post-it notes for my post-it notes. And at one point in my life, it got to the point where I would put like a post-it note on my mirror, bathroom mirror, saying there's a note for this appointment somewhere. And then it got to the point where I had to put notes all over the house and on my car steering wheel. So like, don't forget this meeting today. (laughs) Of course, this was before cell phones and calendars. I put things on my calendar and I still can forget. Um, Um, But uh, I adapt to that in that um, I'm very early, so I'm not late and forget appointments. Mm. If I have a doctor's appointment, I'll be at least an hour early. Right. So sometimes I can imagine that uh, if you're often late to a lot of things, that sometimes you can also find yourself becoming a bit of a time pessimist, right? So where it feels like, you know, I have to be there super early now because I know otherwise I'll forget about it or miss it. I'll start, well, it's not that I forget about it, it's that I get sidetracked on something interests me. It's like the new thing, and Mm. that's something, I think that's something that's typical with INFPs, with the daydreamer and the overlap with maybe ADHD or whatever, that we, we, uh, things come in, we think of things, and we start doing something else. Um, It's like I know I'm talking to you today, And I haven't done anything around the house for four days (laughs) because I didn't want to forget. (laughs) And it sounds crazy, but I, and I was here an hour early (laughs) because I will get sidetracked. And I thought, well, I'm, I want to go on a trip. I was going to go on a trip. And I thought, no, I got this appointment. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, it's still a struggle. Yeah. Mm. So, What would you say um, is the solution to those kinds of like uh, concerns? Uh, Like uh, if somebody's listening to this and it's like, you know, I would like to, I also have that issue sometimes and I would like to break out of it or find a way like to manage my time differently. Like what what do you think uh, would be something that can help? I think what I've started to do in the past year that has helped me a whole lot is um, I listen to my body. And I don't schedule things more than what I can handle. And when I start to feel stressed out, I back off. Um, And uh, sometimes I have to cancel um, appointments, um, 
not that often, but when I know that I'm doing too much. So somebody who has this problem now, I would say to write it down or put it on your phone. Um, I have the phone calendar to go off where it dings. And then when I'm carrying my phone, you know, it'll, it'll ring and people say, why is your phone ringing? I said, well, it's to remind me to do whatever I need to do. That's very important. So that that's helpful. And mm -hmm. then don't uh, bite off more than you can chew. Uh, we all do that. We have our good days where a million ideas will come into play and we put them on. We're going to be doing it. We put it on a calendar. Um, but just listen to your body, I think, and your body will tell you um, whether you're doing too much or not. Mm. And it's okay to rest. Um, I take naps. Uh, I can because I'm retired, but even if you're working or in school, find some time um, it, in the middle of the day to just, if it's not for 10 or 15 minutes, to do nothing. Just just relax. I was thinking... Uh, at what point of time in your life did you start to feel like I'm an adult? Now I'm an adult. Like now I feel like I'm <laughs> got it all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I laugh because uh, we keep our child, as I call childhood wonder. Um, when I thought that I had made it, um, I think actually when I was an adult, thought I was an adult and I had actually made it was when my first child was born because I, here is a creature that I produced that nobody else produced nobody can take it from me um, and this is part of me and that was the most amazing thing I think in my whole life do you know what the personal types your children are um I would guess that when I have three daughters, it's a daughter. I have three daughters. Um, none of them are, are like me. I would say she is an uh, ISTJ. She's definitely ISJ. And I would say ISTJ is what I would say. Hmm. Yeah. I, ha I have an ISTJ daughter, an ESFJ daughter and then i have a i s f p daughter hmm. that's an interesting mix do you yes. feel like they took on different roles naturally in the family yes they don't look alike they don't act alike um <laughs> they are totally different um and now that they're middle-aged they're they're more alike but when they were growing up they were totally totally different hmm. were you an only child no, I have an older brother who's five years older. Mm. How but do you I'm feel the, like I'm the youngest? I'm the youngest, and he says spoiled, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the youngest, and I also tend to say I admit that I'm a bit spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say, um, uh, how do you feel you grew up differently to him? Or what role do you feel like you took on in the family relative to him? Okay, well, that is interesting. Um, how much time do you have? Yeah, my older brother, um, uh, he's also an introvert. He's a sensor. I think he's probably ISFJ. Uh, he's like my mother, and my mother took him under her wing, and he was the like the golden child, if you know all the, the different roles for play. He was the person, according to the extended family and everything. Um, he was the heir apparent, you know, the oldest, he was the, the boy, boys were revered in my family. And so that's the role he took, but he had a learning disability. We don't know what it was because it's so long ago. I mean, I mean, back today we would know, but they didn't have all that testing back then. So um, he had a learning disability. So he tried really hard to please, he was a pleaser but he couldn't measure up. And so the role the, the role that I took is that I, even though I was younger, um, I took up the um, rebel kind of role. To, I protected him. Um, mm -hmm. And I used to tell him when we were teenagers, um, I used to say, why don't you leave home? Because he would, he would, he would cry. He was the crier. He would go in his room and cry if he got yelled at or spanked or whatever. If I got spanked, I'm like, don't hit me again. 
you know, and and I would take I took on his problems. Mm. He would never defend himself, and I would be felt like I had to defend myself and him. Mm. You know, could that be the answer to the question we had earlier? Why you became the protector of the underdogs? Uh, maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Or the, or the uh, reverse could be true. Maybe it, maybe I was protective of him because I had that to start with. Do you feel like you have become actualized in the sense that you've achieved what it is that you wanted to out of life so far? Um, as far as achieving what I wanted to out of life, I have probably lived two or three lifetimes. I've done far more than I ever thought I would be doing. Um, as far as concrete day-to-day things and accomplishments, um, jobs, degrees, families, that type of thing. But on a more intuitive, um, I just go like spiritual level, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in there. Um, I am not actualized. I'm on, I'm on my journey. I'm strongly on a journey. And it's more on this end of life, you get more into... Um, the philosophical and spirituality type of um, mindset more than uh, as goals, more than um, day-to-day goals. Mm. If that answers the question. What do you think being actualized means? Um, Being done? I think actualized means that um, you're open You're truly open to uh, grow. I think we never stop growing. If you stop, if somebody said this, and I don't know who, maybe you would, but uh, uh, let's say when you stop growing, you stop living, you're dead. Uh, You need to keep growing. And um, when you accept that fact that um, you can grow when you want to grow and you want to better yourself, um, that's when you're on your road to actualization. I'm not sure we actually get to the final point to actualization, which mm. is a good thing because there's always something to look forward to. Mm. I would say that uh, actualization, uh, uh-huh. I would say I would define it as we are actualized when we can look back at our life and say, I did something good that I'm happy with. Uh-huh. Like I, I did what... Um, if that this would be it for me now, I would be uh-huh. all right with that. And I'd feel like, you know, I'd be okay with right. this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think yeah. that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're done. I think it means uh-huh. that uh, you're post-actualized at that point, right? And at that point, you get to kind of choose what you want to do. You can keep going. You can keep, you can do something completely different or you can keep going at what you're doing. But uh, at least to me, actualize this, this, uh, it's a little bit more easy to reach than we think. Mm. Yeah. Well, I always said um, my my whole life um, that I didn't want, I spent a lot of time, like I said, with my grandparents and then their siblings. I spent a lot of time when I was little with older people and, and very, very old people. <laughs> and I enjoyed that. And um, I said, well, I don't want to be the kind of person because they would say, you know, I wish I had done this and I wish I had done that. I did not want to be that person to be, uh, I, I said 80 back then, but I was just like 80, 90, 100 years old, rocking on the front porch saying, I wish I had, I wish I had, I wish I had. I wanted to be the person to say, I did. At least mm-hmm. I tried. I did or I tried. Yeah. So you do have so, a good point there. And I hadn't thought about the point of post-actualization. I wonder, at what stage of life do you feel like you are now? And do you have any aspirations for your future? The moment? Yeah. <laughs> any regrets that you're trying to fix <laughs> or get rid of? Okay, my <laughs> regrets. Um, I don't have any regrets. Um, and I had a lot of regrets when I was younger. Um, but I have come to realize that the Everything is a lesson. If you take it as that, if you learn from it, it's not a regret. Because you learned something, it was brought to to you, you experienced it for a reason, as a lesson for you to learn to grow. And My word is going to be grow. So 
So where I am right now, number one, I don't feel as old as I really am. I feel like 20 years younger and I have to remind myself how old I really am. Um, but um, yeah, my goal in life has always really been to live to be a hundred. And so right now at my point, um, I don't have specific goals other than that still <laughs> have a long way to go. Um, but I actually have uh, achieved everything I set out to, like I said, and then 10 times more than that. Um, um, I I would like to continue to travel. I do have a tra travel channel too, but uh, where I travel before COVID, I would like to travel a little bit, but if I don't get to, I'm happy not to. Um, I'm just basically, um, I wanted to be at peace at this point in my life, and I am. And so I've been had a very blessed and fortunate life with every trial and tribulation challenge that's come along. They've been learning that's prepared me for where I am now and who I am now. I want to say thank you so much for coming on to my channel and for sharing with all other INFPs and other people interested in INFPs. And I would say, like, um, Dee is an amazing person to kind of bring with you to tune into on all their INFPA insights to take with you outside on the porch and to sit and listen to it, like while you're having a coffee or a tea, you know, in the sunny in the morning, you know, to really just like take a second to get, get some inspiration, thoughts and stimulation. So I really recommend checking out their channel and helping her get to uh, 1,000 subscribers and once again uh thank you so much for joining in do you have any final thoughts or words well the only thing i would like to say is i always enjoy talking with you and i appreciate uh coming um to your channel and i will say you are the first uh, person who has asked me to come so, uh, so it's, um, this is a celebration day for me so i'm excited always a pleasure eric